Um, so we're going to cover a couple of things here, the first being the theory of action, objectives, and guiding principles. So how do you really create a vision for the work around career pathways? I know that a lot of you are really en engaged in this work already, even deeply engaged in this work. We just want to ensure that you're stopping and considering the vision. Um, I'm sure you all have a vision for the work that you're doing, but want to stress the importance of that and how you can convey that to other folks. Um, next, we'll go into communications and engagement, that sort of hairy topic that is so important to the success of the work here. Then we'll head to professional development and support and how you can really support principal and teacher leaders in this um, effort. And then to what I call the elephant in the room, funding sustainability. So really thinking about how do you fund this work in an ongoing way. Sure, it's great to get some kickstart money, but what happens when that money runs out? What do you do? How do you keep that going? How do you keep this momentum going? Um, and then finally, program evaluation. So how do you know what you're doing is working or not working? What do you look at with that? Um, and that actually feeds, of course, into all of these other pieces. How do you then uh, make a more robust professional development plan? How do you use your successes and your bright spots to really leverage that for funding, support, and sustainability of your program? Thanks. <laughs> um, so first, a little bit of an uh, introduction here. So I'm going I'm to pick this side of the room for right now. Uh, but I know there are two screens up there. So this shows you a chart from a report called The Irreplaceables that came out in 2012. Um, and what it really shows you is that high-performing teachers are leaving the classroom. This is what we call regrettable attrition. So in, in the course of any year, you're going to have some teachers leave your building. And there's some natural attrition that happens because of personal reasons, also attrition that happens because of teachers who really ought to maybe move on um, as they go through the course of their career, right? But there's a group of people that we call the irreplaceable. These are your top performing teachers. And the way we think about this or talk about this is to say, if you lost that particular teacher, how sad would you be? How much time and effort would it take to replace that one person? And what we see, unfortunately, is that across the nation, in one year alone, 10,000 of those irreplaceable teachers are leaving their schools. And that has a, a real impact on how students are able to learn and achieve. Um, and when these teachers leave, they cite reasons for why they're leaving. And two of the top reasons were actually around compensation in career advancement, opportunities for career advancement. And that's probably no surprise to anybody in this room. The idea that you go into a room, you close the door, and you do the same job for 25, 30 years. Um, and how that isn't appealing to somebody who really wants to extend their reach in the profession. And so when we interview these top teachers and say, why are you leaving? What does that look like? What we hear is that the simple act of creating meaningful opportunities to pursue mastery in something, to really advance your skills, has a significant difference, and it makes a significant difference in how a teacher views their career and how long they want to stay. Career pathways even more so than compensation. So saying to somebody, I'll pay you more, I'll give you an opportunity to really progress in your career, the number one there is the, the opportunity to really progress in your career. In fact, 50 to 80% of teachers say that they would stay longer due to expanded career opportunities. And the great news there is that this is a benefit to your schools, too, because you're talking about leveraging your top teachers. So not only are you retaining them, but you're also able to further programs and initiatives and priorities that your district has along the way. So let's stop here, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie, who's going to talk a little bit about this vision, how you create this vision and, um, and project out that vision for what you want to achieve with your career pathways. Great. Thank you, Emily. So as you can see here, first we wanted to start off by talking about the objectives for this work. So again, when you started off this work, you had a vision for what your career ladder and your leadership roles would look like for both teacher leaders and principal leaders within your district. So what you see here on this slide is a sampling of objectives that have been used by other districts across the nation that are doing very similar work. And you can see here are things that they're trying to accomplish by having these leadership roles available within their schools. So again, when a district is starting to engage within this work, they should start off by thinking about their local context, they should think about what their priorities are, and then most importantly, what the challenges are that they see within their schools on a daily basis. 
and then to think about how they can use these leadership roles in a really strategic and meaningful way, a thoughtful way, in order to help to address some of those challenges. So as Emily was just talking about, retention is one that we see come up quite often across the districts where we do this work. And that's the first one you see listed on this slide here. So a lot of districts have been putting these career pathways and these leadership roles in place in order to meaningfully recognize their top educators within their schools by giving them leadership opportunities within their schools. The next one you see listed here is around recruitment. So recruitment is a really big challenge, particularly to attract top talent to, to schools and to districts. And these career pathways have been used as a recruitment tool by telling early career teachers, here are the career advancement opportunities that are available to you throughout the course of your career, and here are the leadership, role, the leadership skills you can develop over that time. It's a really great tool for recruitment. Leadership roles also help us to tap into our top talent. So every single day we have excellent teachers and principals within schools that are doing excellent work. These leadership roles allow us the opportunity to tap into that expertise, to really utilize their skills and give them the opportunity to share those strategies and those skills and that knowledge with other teachers and with other students in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. It also allows us to increase students' access to effective teachers and principals, particularly when we think about high-need schools and the teachers and principals within those schools. And lastly, the last one you see here is creating a depth of leadership. So these leadership roles allow teachers to develop leadership skills that they wouldn't have otherwise, allows principals to distribute leadership within their schools, and again, allows the district to develop this pipeline of leadership over time. Next slide, please. The one before that. Okay, great. So what we see on this slide here is what we call guiding design principles. So as districts are starting to design this work, starting to implement these systems, they can develop a list of principles that they will use to help guide their conversations around implementation and um, design. And so what you see here, again, is a list of guiding principles that have been used across the, state, across the, the nation in um, districts that are implementing this work. We're not going to review all of these, so don't worry. <laughs> but wanted to give you a sense of what we were talking about here. So the first one you see listed here is focused on performance. So really being able to develop systems that focus on performance, not only by recognizing your best educators using these leadership roles, but also supporting the performance of teachers and students within your schools on a daily basis. Another one that you see here is specialization. So these leadership skills really allow teachers the opportunity to specialize in an area of interest or to develop a skill set that they want to develop over time. And then the last one here is flexibility and sustainability. So as Emily mentioned, I think this is a topic that's on everyone's mind. So creating systems that are flexible enough that you can really use these leadership roles to address the unique challenges that schools have every day within their schools. But also creating systems that are sustainable, sustainable over the long term, so that teachers and principals have leadership opportunities they can take on over the course of their career. So next slide, please. Great. So now we're here from Greece Central School District. We have some videos from the district. So as we mentioned earlier, they have been working to implement career ladders and leadership roles within their district. And in this video, the superintendent talks about their strategic plan. And she talks about how these leadership roles have been used to help support their strategic plan. So let's um, listen to what they have to say here. So retention of principals and teachers is absolutely critical. Any superintendent knows the time and energy it takes to provide the kind of coaching and mentoring necessary to ensure that people are all headed in the same direction, um, all have a deep understanding of a district strategic plan and mission, and can work as a team. After putting that kind of time and attention into developing those teams, you want to make sure that they are staying together long enough to make a sustained difference. So retention becomes critical. The career pathways that we're able to offer by providing opportunities for teachers to become leaders and our principals to become leaders ensures that they're able to extend their skill sets and their practice by and providing um, opportunities for them to showcase their learnings and their knowledge while learning from others and learning from their peers. So we're very, very committed to making sure that we maintain the quality of the program, but that we maintain our capacity as well through staff retention. So if you look at implementation, we're still at the beginning phases of this, and I thought we did a great job, but we're all very excited to see where this program is going because we feel safe 
and we feel trusted by the administrators in the district to do what we need to support our own colleagues. I think we recognize that we're all equally unskilled in some areas. Nobody can be an expert when you're implementing new curriculum and new strategies. So what we're really trying to do is create this culture of innovation and a culture where we use some elements of design thinking to really focus on what the end user needs and what they require in order to feel comfortable with implementation of new initiatives. So it's again that back mapping and that relationship building that becomes critical to us. So if, if you go back in time in Greece, um, five, 10 years, um, it was a somewhat broken system in terms of trust and relationships. So I had worked here as a building principal at the time, and um, it was really, really evident because of changes in leadership um, over time. We had multiple superintendents. Um, that people had gotten to the point of not really being able to trust um, leaders, not being able to trust administration, not being able to trust initiatives moving forward that they were going to stick. So it became really, really clear that um, something needed to change. And I think um, the biggest thing that needed to change was, was trust and trying to build some trust so that people could um, know that the things moving forward were going to be um, really invested in and, and we were gonna stick with them. And what was challenging about that as a classroom teacher, you had different initiatives that would come out and different PD models that would come out. And when your leadership changed, ideas changed and philosophies changed. So we, as, we didn't know who to turn to to ask to questions, and we didn't have a clear chain of command for communication in the district. And that went right from teacher right to principals, because as a principal with new superintendents coming in and changing, um, it was really difficult to make sure that you were giving people the right message and that they um, had the right supports in place. Well, the benefit of coming into the Greece Central School District when I did was that we had a reform agenda that was ready to be looked at, studied, and implemented. So when I came in, did the traditional entry plan process, interviewed multiple stakeholders, listened to people about what the strengths and needs were in the district, and then one of the needs was articulated K-12 curriculum um, to build a sense of community, a sense of direction and purpose, to be clearer about what the ultimate goals were, roles and responsibilities, and there was a great need for people to understand the direction of the district and to have a voice in that direction. The Regis Reform Agenda provided the perfect opportunity for us to take the teacher leader model and administrative effectiveness and use the APPR process to create systems of cohesion. So now we have an opportunity for teachers to see themselves as part of um, the larger success of our school district K-12 as opposed to being evaluated for the impact they have on with their students for that particular year. And what I feel uh, was a huge turning point for Greece was the rollout of the APPR. We had a very, very unique model where it, it really was the beginning, in my eyes, of teacher leadership. Um, the superintendent worked with the State Teachers Union, NYSIT, and the Greece Teachers Association to find the best way to implement the new evaluation tool that would then have a direct impact on student learning. And what we did was we had our senior union reps at each building do the um, training and the rollout of the APPR. So the union reps worked alongside with NYSIT and trained the teachers and the administrators. And that was the first time in my 15 years here in this district that I saw teachers in that position of doing the rollout of something for all stakeholders at one time. And what I would add to that, I guess, the piece there is it wasn't just a token. It wasn't just let's give them a presentation and have them roll that out for us. I think the, the biggest difference, and I think this is what you would hear from teachers, is that there was a, a sincerity to that and that they really wanted or we really wanted the teachers to be part of it and, um, and not just with the rollout but with the actual day-to-day -day work. Um, and that was symbolic in terms of who presented but it also was symbolic in terms of who's been included in all these different components along the way. Great, so now here on the next slide, we wanted to give you all an opportunity, as we mentioned, to have these discussions at your tables. As Emily mentioned a few minutes ago, we understand that some districts are already beyond the design period. You might already be implementing these systems within your districts, and that's okay. 
Um, in a few minutes, we'll talk about the communications and engagement process, and it's really important to be able to communicate the objectives of this work when communicating about this work to stakeholders within your district. So it's never too late to really think about how you would define and articulate what your objectives and guiding principles are for your career pathway system and your leadership roles. So as you can see here, there are three discussion questions. You'll be focusing on these over the next 10 minutes or so. The first one is to step back and think about how you would define those objectives and guiding principles for your district. And the second one, think about how those objectives and guiding principles have guided your design conversations and your implementation process to date. And then in the last one, think about how you can now improve the process within your district to make sure that you're aligning the work of both your teacher leaders and your principal leaders every day so that you're going to accomplish the objectives for the overall system. So again, there's 10 minutes. You can discuss with the pe people at your table. If you're with other people from your district, that's great. And if not, that's also totally OK. Um, and we'll let you know when five minutes have passed and also when 10 minutes have passed. And we'll be circulating. So also feel free to, to tag one of us, too, if you have questions. Thanks. This is a convening uh, design to give you these opportunities to really network across districts. So glad to hear it. Um, hearing a lot of conversation that we hear um, when we're working with different places, different districts, different schools across the country. So similar things. It's fun to see everybody in the same room where you have larger districts um, and small, very small districts sometimes struggling with the same sorts of things. So lots about role definition. Hey, we've been doing this for, for, for a while, but could we clearly break it down into a couple of uh, concise statements about what our overall goals are for this work, that type of thing. And sometimes you do have to dig into the work before you fully know how to project it out. And that's okay too. And that's why we have this exercise of sort of saying, stop, what are our overall goals? How can we convey that in a couple of sentences and then you know what do we do with it from there so really defining your vision for the work so you define this vision now what stakeholder communications and engagement really important part of this work you have a vision for it how do you actually bring others on board with that vision and how do you gain, gain clarity around that it sounds like something so simple but we know that you're all dealing with this in a variety of ways so when we talk about communication, it really is a huge bucket because it's everybody from your high-performing teachers you want to have in these roles to the community at large to if you're working with your union on this um, or if you're not working with your union on this. You need to be working with your union on this, right? How do you get everybody at the table to really fully actualize that vision that you have for the work? So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, now. So whenever I talk with a district about communications and the importance of it and the role of it, I start by saying no communication is negative communication. As humans, we always will fill the void. So if people aren't hearing messages from you, don't think that they're not hearing messages. They still are. They're just he hearing them from other people or they're making them up <laughs> in their heads. They're, they're getting information or they're taking assumptions around what you're trying to achieve because you're not clearly articulating your vision for what you want to achieve to them and you're not engaging them with uh, in this work. So one of the things that we think is most important is to, to build support and buy-in by involving different groups of people along the way. This is tricky to do, understandably. There's a natural tendency, and I have it even in my own, I experienced this this week even on something, where we want to hold something really close and tight until we feel like we've got this polished thing that we can give to everyone and say, ta-da, like, this is what it's going to look like and here's what it's going to achieve and now you can get excited. Ready? Go. But that's not really how people get on board. They need to be introduced to these ideas. They need to feel buy-in on it. And so it's okay to give those early messages. In fact, you should of saying, you know what? We're building a career pathway. We don't know what it's going to look like yet. We want you to be a part of it. We want to let you know that this is coming because we feel that it's important to address you know, retention or to address uh, mastery or to address a specific problem we're having within our district or in our school. And we think we can best do this by introducing teacher and principal leadership to the school. We want you to come along. We want you to help us figure out what that could look like in a way that's going to work for everybody. So we have a couple of groups here. I'm going to choose this side of the room now just to keep you hopping. 
Um, and so we have a couple of groups here that we really suggest are key in this work. The first is, is teachers, right? Um, teachers are the, the folks who you want as teacher leaders, but too often we say, okay, we know what's good for a teacher or we know what's gonna make them happy or, or get them excited without actually engaging them in the work. So engaging both your teachers who you want to have in these roles, also teachers who would be affected by them, right? So if you're introducing a type of teacher leadership role in which you might have somebody coaching other new teachers or teachers who are struggling, why not involve those struggling teachers and say what kind of support from a peer would be helpful to you? What would that look like? Does somebody come in and observe you or do they come in and co-teach with you? Do they plan with you in small teams after school? What does that support, what would that support look like for you? The second group is principals from a variety of perspectives here. So principals really do understand their school's needs. That's, that's the idea behind the principal there. Um, and so really saying uh, if you're coming, if you're sitting in this room and you're coming from more of a central perspective, to not assume that what's good for one school is good for another school, or even that you know what, how a school might react to this. But to really engage deeply and say what is the school's need and how can we meet it, and to think outside of the box and say, I know for a lot of districts here, you're working, um, you're from a small district, you have three schools, four schools, something like that. So how can you think outside of the box? Why does it need to be confined to just one school? Could you look at this from a perspective of the district and have teacher leaders who span over several schools? What might that look like in talking and engaging with principals to see um, what you can do with that? So central office staff, um, anybody who's going to be responsible for helping get this off the ground or to run the logistics behind it, uh, how can they play a role in designing these teacher and principal leadership roles? What role can they play in selection? That also helps uh, schools to give you both a, a perspective from somebody who's not within a school and to alleviate some of the workload around establishing these career pathway roles. And then finally, local associations. So whoever's in your community that you think uh, could really make a difference. So we had some folks submit some problems of practice, and one of the things we saw come up as a common theme is this idea of parental engagement. So how can we really look at this? And why not go out and sort of say, what's lacking here, um, and how could we solve this or address this through leveraging, by leveraging, our best teachers in our district or in our school? Can somebody take this off on in a meaningful way to really affect change uh, in terms of whatever's going on? So if that's a lack of parental engagement, how could you address that through a teacher or principal leader role who could really own this for the district and drive strategies in a way that it hasn't had that intensive time and focus on it before? So here are some vehicles. These are just things to get your start, start you thinking on this. Um, usually when I present the slide to anybody, uh, they'll hone in on one and they'll say, that would never work. Oftentimes it's the one around public meetings and town halls. That seems to be one where everyone's like, whoo, everybody in the room looking at me, that's not the way I wanna go. That's okay. For some districts it works, for some schools it works, for some it doesn't, and that's fine too. In a minute we're gonna give you another opportunity to sort of engage in small tables. What I'd encourage you to do is think outside of the box on this. Uh, do you communicate, how do you communicate with teachers or other stakeholder groups within your school or within your district? And are you doing the same things over and over again? What kind of results are you getting? So often it's, you know, we send an email out. Okay, that's information out. How are you getting information in? To make sure that you have that complete loop, and just like we say with anything, multiple measures are a good thing to look at things from different perspectives and angles. Looking at your communications and engagement strategy and saying what things could we employ and how could we use different messages within it is going to be key. So the messages that you're giving to teachers are probably similar but not the same, exactly the same as anything you would want to say to principal groups or to others within the community. So the key here is to figure out what you want somebody to walk away knowing or getting excited about and how you're going to take them through that arc of change and how you can really get there by using different vehicles to do it. How do you make that a two-way street? 
Okay, so again, um, Greece is, is featured in this. I heard them this morning. It's, it's they're the, the celebrity school district of the day, I guess. Um, they're doing a lot of great work around the Career Pathways piece, and we asked them for a little bit more information on how they have uh, really engaged the community and engaged uh, teachers within their schools around this work. Um, and I think you're going to hear a lot of information that will be useful to you, including how they've involved their union in the work, too. You need to also put up the vo put up the volume. Yeah. <laughs> With labor management collaboration is there's a number of models across the country and exemplars of school districts. The benefit of working with labor management collaboration is there's a number of models across the country and exemplars of school districts that really built um, wonderful reform results for students around this notion of collaboration. It's a lot easier for everybody to come to the table, focus on students and their needs, and design together than to have somebody sit in isolation and design something and then try to sell it to everybody else. So it may seem like it takes more time to build the collaboration on the front end, but it actually is much more efficient and effective in terms of the results. The um, strategic plan also provided the opportunity to actually put the practice into motion. Um, so it wasn't an automatic, it was a lot of discussion around the right strategies, the right goals, um, and the design thinking process requires that you design things, you put them out there, you prototype, you try them out, you try to get response from end users. So I know there was some frustration in the amount of time and the amount of uh, renditions of the strategic plan that people saw, but it was really important for people to read it and tell us what they think it said. What did it, what did it mean to them? What would it signal to them? And we very carefully went back and reworked wording and reworked messaging until we felt that it really reflected sort of what we collectively wanted as our vision, mission, and team. And we're very focused on on-time high school graduation for all students and closing those achievement gaps. The focus on that sort of lets us all know what we're doing and how we're working together and what that end result needs to be for us. Regarding all of the unions and various stakeholder groups, whether it's parents, whether it's teachers, whether it's support staff, whether it's administrators, we are all in this together and we're working together uh, versus in isolation. So whether it's uh, monthly check-in meetings, whether it's focus groups, whether it's learning walks, whether it's leadership meetings that we have with the entire uh, administrative team, whether it's monthly uh, union labor relations meetings where we're discussing not only um, the concerns that we have, or, but ultimately how can we work together um, to improve the achievement of both students and staff uh, in, in the district. The system or the process we've used at Greece is to have a design team um, that meets and talks about the roles and responsibilities of teacher leaders, school leaders, how principals all um, fit into a model where we're working together with district office teaching and learning teams. So we are also reorganized the district office into the teams that can support schools, principals, and the teachers and the learning in those schools. Again, um, that's an ongoing process of communication defining what's working, what's not working, and having a willingness to try to keep that um, um, focus on the end result or the end goal of how to provide this. We, we kicked everything off with the Leadership Academy and we received a, a lot of feedback about what the participants could use back at their building, what would they plan to, what would they need more of, and um, how, how to go further. Um, and so from there, we were able to develop professional development for the year at least a blueprint. At other points during the year, we also um, did uh, interviews with the principals directly to find out what kinds of things are happening in their building. Um, there's opportunities to get feedback at the professional development sessions or our monthly principal meetings. Um, and then there's the end of the year um, survey that the teacher leaders do twice a year. So we get a lot of feedback from that. Plus they also keep um, teacher leader logs and that kind of gives us a breakdown of where they spend most of their time. 
at the building level, a minimum of two community days a month on our PLC time for professional learning communities where like teachers and like content areas at like grade level are having those conversations about their lessons, about student work, about assessments, about creating CFAs, looking at student work, et cetera. Um, but we also have, a, each school has a school improvement team. So feedback is solicited through the PLC process, as well as the school improvement team, as well as through the APPR process within the building. So there are multiple times for teachers and staff members to provide feedback um, to the various stakeholders of the building. And we use that feedback to design the structure of professional development that goes on the other two Tuesdays of the month, which is full um, school uh, staff um, where we're able to provide specific professional development and specific skills in specific areas of that. We know that we are a lifeline of supporters um, and we are we are in this together uh, to improve. Great, so a lot of key messages around there, and in the key there is almost over communicating. So asking yourself, how does somebody feel about this, and how do I know? Did I actually hear it from them, or am I making that assumption? Where did I get that feedback from? So just like we did in the last um, little section here, we're going to give you a moment to uh, discuss this in your small groups and to really think and consider the best way to communicate with the various stakeholders in your district. So three discussion questions. Who should be engaged and why, why should they be engaged? Why is it important to get to them? That really gets you at the messages that they need to hear. Secondly, how have you engaged those folks? Um, and which, what's been most effective in doing that? What, and also then, you know, what hasn't worked for you? And how can you, um, how can you strengthen those efforts? Um, what challenges do you need to address? So just as we did last time, just discuss in your small groups. And if you're with your district, that's great. And if not, that's great too, because you can do some cross-district collaboration here. So we'll give you the five-minute warning, and we'll be circulating. Thanks. process when implementing a career ladder system or leadership roles is to think about the support and the professional development that leaders need in order to be able to hit the ground running and to do their work really well within their schools. Um, it's important to think about the fact that often when we have teachers and principals stepping into some of these leadership roles, we're asking them to take on responsibilities that they haven't had to take on before. And it's possible that we're asking them to use skills that they haven't had a chance to develop in their past roles. And so an important part of the implementation process is to really think about what this professional development and support should look like in order to make sure that our leaders have the information and the skills that they need in order to work effectively with teachers within schools and to accomplish those objectives we were just talking about earlier. On this slide here, you can see at the bottom, there are four main methods that we've seen district provide this professional development and support for their leaders. There are implementation planning meetings, there's formal professional development and trainings that we're all familiar with, there's facilitated teacher leader and principal group discussions and meetings, and there's also one-on-one -on -one support and coaching. So we're going to dig into each of these a little bit more to hear about how we can provide support and professional development through these different methods. Now it's important to be clear that districts can choose to provide this professional development and support in the way that makes the most sense for them. So we understand that there's limited capacity, there's limited funding. And so again, it's about thinking about what kinds of support and professional development you can provide and what's the best approach for your particular district. So really this is meant to be a sampling of different strategies that you can put into place within your district. So the first one that's listed here is implementation planning sessions. Now implementation planning sessions are extremely key. We find that it helps teachers and teacher leaders, principals, school leadership team members, 
and district leadership to come together and to think about the work that's coming up ahead. They have a chance to think about who the leaders will work with and why, when they're going to work with those people, and what they hope to accomplish as a result of those activities. So these implementation planning sessions really provide leaders with the information they need so they can hit that ground running, they have an action plan, and they know what they'll be doing throughout the school year. And again, this doesn't have to happen just at the beginning of the school year. It can happen throughout the school year. So there's ways that you can discuss the progress that you've made and to create, create course corrections throughout the year as well. The next one you see listed here is one-on-one -on -one support. One-on-one -on -one support is key. It's important for leaders to feel like they have someone they can go to in order to check in on their progress, to talk about well, how the work is going within their schools, what are the challenges that they're seeing, and have a thought partner they can work with in order to think about strategies and solutions they can put into place. Now, these one, this one-on-one -on -one support can be provided by a variety of people. It could be the principal, but it can also be an assistant principal. It could be someone else within the school building. It can be someone from the district central office. The idea here is that the one-on-one -on -one support is available and that they're able to get this day-to-day -day management and that day-to-day -day support on an ongoing basis. The next one here is communities. We're going to talk a lot about communities and learning communities as part of this conference. So communities, again, provide an opportunity for leaders to come together, and they can share resources and strategies. They can talk about lessons learned, and it's a really powerful thing that we've seen work across a lot of districts doing this work. It creates a, a, an opportunity for a network of leadership within your district and allows them to talk to someone else who's going through the same challenges, having the same experiences. It allows them to really rely on each other for that support on an ongoing way as well. And the last one here is formal professional development. We're all really familiar with formal professional development sessions. I just turn it off. Um, and formal professional development sessions should really be aligned to the responsibilities of the leadership roles within your district. So when you think about the leadership roles that you have in place, thinking about what are the skills, what's the knowledge that they need to be able to do this work. Now, how can we provide them access to that information and to those skills through professional development sessions? So these sessions can cover a lot of different topics. It can be anything from time management and project management to completing observations or coaching techniques. The idea here is to make sure that they have what they need to be successful. Now something that we also often see when doing this work with districts across the nation is that they really focus on their teacher leader development. How are we going to give them professional development and support? But it's also important to think about the managers of the leaders as well. Now the managers are the ones who are managing the day-to-day -day work of these leaders and they also need to have the skills and the information they need to be able to provide that ongoing support to their leaders. So again, there are a variety of ways that this support can be provided. That again, these implementation planning sessions give them the opportunity to step back and think strategically about the work in the year ahead and how it's going to get done and what their approach will be. They can also use district-wide check-ins. This is a really great way to check in on the progress of the work throughout the school year, to hear what's working, what's not working, to think about what kind of corrections can be made that school year or the following school year, and constantly think about how we can make this work stronger and better for our teachers and for our students. The really great piece about this is that you don't have to add an extra meeting to already busy schedules. We know everyone has a busy schedule and the last thing you need is another meeting on your calendar. So really utilizing check-ins that are already on your calendars in order to check in on this progress is also great. And the last piece here is one-on-one -on -one support. So thinking about how managers can also get that one-on-one -on -one support that I was just talking about for leaders. Making sure they know who to go to if they need more information or if they have questions so that they can provide their leaders with the day-to-day -day management as well. So again, we're going to hear um, from Greece Central School District. Their grant coordinator is on this video, and she's talking about the type of professional development and support they've provided their teacher leaders. Um, and they've been doing some really great work in that area. So we'll go ahead and hear what their approach has been. strategic plan in Vision Greece 2017. So starting with the strategic plan, we have the learning forward standards for professional learning, and we adopted the New York City Leadership Academy's guiding principles for professional learning as well. And of course, looking at the ultimate goal, all students college and career ready, graduating high school on time, 
who centered on professional development on the topics of APPR, Common Core, helping teachers make those shifts, and on data-driven instruction. As our teacher leaders were also new to their positions, we gave them a very healthy dose of coaching instruction through a course from Learning Forward First and then to the national research-based model of cognitive coaching, whereby teacher leaders learned to coach teachers in instructional planning and in problem solving as well. We all work to support teacher leaders, so we all attend professional development together, and that's really helpful, and many times teacher leaders stay behind and they work to support each other. They also communicate on an ongoing basis with each other, and they travel to each other's buildings. That release time allows them to do that, so they can see each other uh, deliver a professional learning session. They can invite others to come help them and team up to go to buildings to provide professional learning, so they're always in collaboration with each other. We're looking at a lot of different information to determine how successful our teacher leaders have been. For example, teacher leaders complete weekly logs on our online professional learning system, and they document their work. So we know that they are getting into classrooms, they're observing and providing feedback to teachers, they're having teachers observe their work um, in a peer coaching model, um, they're also working with our professional learning community groups, departments, grade levels, so if we can go back to the presentation, Courtney. Thank you. Great. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over back to Emily to talk about funding sustainability. Great. Thanks. So now's the point where everyone looks at me and wishes that I had the magic secret, the button that you could push that makes all of this work sustainable, uh, to really make sure that you can do this in your schools for years to come. Sadly, I don't have a magic bullet on this, but I want to talk a little bit more about what, how you can approach this and what it might look like. So the first thing is that, just to acknowledge that this is an ongoing challenge. I actually couldn't name a district across the country that doesn't have this challenge. Doesn't actually matter if you're really small or if you're tremendously large. Funding sustainability is very difficult at any level um, of this work. But it's important to first consider all of the factors that play a role in funding sustainability. So to get a really good sense of what you're going to need to even spend money on. And oftentimes with Career Pathways, you start this work and then it starts to snowball and you start to realize the different things that you need to pay for. And it can be a little overwhelming at first too. So we've listed out some of those things here. So the first is kind of an obvious, like the number one check, what do you pay teacher leaders or principal teacher, or principal leaders rather? What is their, their compensation? What does it look like? Um, do they get stipends? Is this part of a base salary adjustment? What, what are you actually giving them as part of this? The second is release time coverage. So some of you are probably implementing release time. Others of you may not be. Others of you may be thinking about a teacher leadership role that's just in addition to the full role that a teacher has. I will say from our work across the country, most times teacher leaders will tell you that it's very difficult to do the job, to do a meaningful, robust teacher leadership position on top of the full course load that they have. And of course, the idea here is not to further burn out our best top teachers, it's to extend their reach and consider that. So a plug for the toolkit that Courtney told you about, there is a deck about how to think uh, about release time, really, as part of that toolkit, why it's important and how you can consider incorporating it into your work. But when you do, you do need to consider the cost of that. So you're taking somebody out of the classroom part of the time, how much time are you taking them out? How, what does that coverage look like? That does incur an additional cost. Professional development. So as you just saw from Greece, they're doing quite a bit around professional development. One of the things that strikes me when I see that video is that they have different providers offering it. So it's not just the same vehicle for delivery. How do you actually factor in the cost on that? Central office support. Um, supporting everything that happens within a career pathway. And then finally, technology and data systems, especially if you're building them out to really uh, address an initiative or priority that you have going on at the district. So by now, you're probably thinking, whew, okay, that's a lot. How are we really now, how are we gonna ever afford this? My answer to that is that there isn't one solution. 
but there is a solution. You just have to find it for yourself. So this is, it sounds really difficult, doesn't it? This is something that I, they actually dress to when I'm designing compensation systems too. That this is the type of work where saying we want to do it and we're going to do it on top of everything that we're already doing probably isn't going to work. So you can consider this from a couple of points of view. And the first one that I'll say that's important is to really consider what you're doing now in your district and if it's working. And how do you know that it's working? So if you're trying to design a career pathway to address a specific problem, address literacy instruction in your schools, say, take a look at what you're doing already around literacy. Is it working? If it's working and you're looking to enhance it, then okay. But if it's not working and you're looking for something different, this is the key here. It's okay to reallocate funds around this. It's okay to move dollars. It's, this is why it comes back to communication, right? And having that vision, clearly articulating it and investing others in it. Because if the first time they hear about you cutting a program or reallocating funding, we want to do this now and they've never heard about it and they don't know why you're doing it and what you're hoping to achieve and how they're going to play a role in it, it's really, it comes off as very, very aggressive. But if you're engaging people like Greece has in a strategic plan to say these are the things that we want to achieve and look, you played a role in determining those things that we want to achieve. So if together this is our vision, we need to really seriously consider how we're going to make that vision a reality. So that's one part of, of what you can do with this. The second part is to think about the goals that you're trying to achieve themselves. So for a lot of you, I anticipate that that'll be retention. If you think about retention, you're thinking about how much it costs to replace one of those irreplaceable teachers when they go. So you have somebody come in, they, they've left the district, um, and what does it cost to replace that person in terms of finding them, training them up, getting them in, into your district as a whole? The cost of teacher turn, turnover is quite high. So if you're doing these, these pathways in a meaningful way, you should experience lower retention and that is also another cost that you're avoiding that you can sort of think about your dollars in that way. Now, I know that retention and, and, and the attraction and teacher turnover, that's not often something that we allocate money towards, but it's also a good way to approach things when you think about where you're saving money and how you can look at this in a long-term place. So again, there's not one easy solution to it, but the key here is to figure out where you're going to need to spend your dollars and then take a look at how you already are spending your dollars and figure out the balance between the two. So you can do things like figure out what your classroom looks like. Don't be bound by this is how we've always done it, so this is what we're going to do. Remember, career pathway work is actually really innovative work to really think about how you're leveraging your best teachers. So consider that within your school system as, as a whole to think about the role of the teacher, who they're teaching, when they're teaching, and how they're supported by one another. Now that can be a lot of change. You can start small on this too. Nobody says that in the first couple of years you need to roll out a huge full-scale career pathway system. It's okay to pilot some things too. Get those wins in the early years through the grant funding or whatever funding that you have right now and slowly build momentum to a point where it would be really detrimental to not have these roles in the district. And then you can consider what your trade-offs are. And hand in hand with this, how do you know when it's working and how do you know when it's not working? Um, because this, again, just like with any other program, you want to ensure that what you're, you're, you're setting out to achieve is actually being achieved, that you're meeting your objectives to the work, that the dollars that you're spending toward uh, leadership stipends and towards that release time are really beneficial. And to really effectively consider program evaluation, you need to look at it from a couple of ways. So the first is operational success. The implemented leadership roles, do they function as designed? So you have these teacher leader roles, you have principal leader roles. Are the teacher leaders and principal leaders actually doing what you set out to do? Do they know what they're setting out to do? Do they have clear job descriptions? Do they understand it? Do you understand it? And is it actually working as functioned or as designed? Second is results and outcomes. So this goes back to your vision for the work, your guiding principles and your objectives. So given these 
principal leaders and these teacher leaders is that are they with the work that they're doing is it actually affecting what you hoped it would affect whether that's retention distributed leadership some of the ones that Stephanie showed you at the beginning of this presentation whether it's addressing that specific priority that you have within your schools it's working with that subset population that you're really trying to reach and you're pouring a lot of resources into what's moving on that and how do you know and the third is positive stakeholder perceptions. So key groups within the district really understand what's going on. They're invested and bought into the work and they know where you're headed with it too. That's particularly important in your first couple of years. That can be sort of a benchmark measure too because that middle one, that's our elusive one, right? Results and outcomes, everything we all do is, is in service of raising student achievement. Um, but we have to know along the way whether we're headed towards that actual goal. And part of that is ensuring that what we designed works and also people are invested in it so that it can proceed smoothly along. So when you consider program evaluation to really think about whether your career pathway system is working, um, you want to do this with a lot of information and it's in service of doing a couple of things. So the, the process of having any career pathway is not just as simple as designing it and there you go, you have it. You all already know this. It's very cyclical. You heard this from Greece. I know it's not something that's new to you all as a concept. That you design a role, you see whether it works or not, you see what worked, what didn't work, and then you refine from there. And say this worked but I, and I want to expand it or this didn't quite work, here's how we need to change it um, for whatever reason it didn't work. The second here is to understand the effect of implemented leadership roles on teacher and student outcomes. But again, like you need to, to really get at the impact this has on those outcomes. Um, and then to monitor perceptions regarding roles. This is all about change management theory. Um, we are talking about something that really is exciting to a lot of people, but it can also be once you get into the nitty gritty of the details, as I just said, with all the things you need to plan for plot out funding for, can really be very in the weeds. And it can seem like too much to, to try to do or to try to, try to change. And the key in any program evaluation, particularly at first, is to hit on those bright spots of the work to figure out what is working and highlight that and build upon it. You're not gonna get it right in the first year, and that's okay. And then finally, to monitor the system's cost and sustainability. That's another key reason you want to be monitoring all of this work, too. To say, we projected it would cost this much. Here's how much it's really costing, and here's why. Is that sustainable? Can we find other dollars within the district to allocate toward it? Why are we not? So generally, this takes place in a couple of phases. The first here is to develop your objectives which you all are already doing, and to really think about your key research questions. So at the end of this year, I will know that this worked because X, Y, and Z. What do we want to know? Do we want to know that there's a difference in retention of top performing teachers? Do we want to know that struggling teachers cite their teacher leaders or their principal leaders as having a significant impact on their growth over the course of the year? Do we want to see uh, parental or community engagement increase? If so, by what percentage? I've worked with a district um, that actually looked at the number of referrals to the office. They had a, a designed a role that was really around, uh, essentially a role around classroom management, to take some bright stars of classroom management in a particular school and say, how can those teacher leaders really help their colleagues to develop in this area, and one of the ways that they wanted to see this come out was to see fewer referrals to the office. They did, by the way. It's really exciting. So the second phase on this is data collection. So lots and lots of data. So the first here is teacher and principal evaluations. You want to collect that data to see if there are changes there. You're going to want to collect student um, outcome data in all the various forms that you can see that. And then also different things like student surveys, which are a great proxy. Um, you can also do focus groups of both teachers and students and principals to really see what's working uh, across the schools, both by those who are being served by teacher leaders and principal leaders, and then also the teacher leaders and principal leaders themselves. Collecting all of that data that you can get your hands on. Then finally, analyzing it to really address those three measures that we saw on the last slide. Whether the rules are working, 
what impact they're having on your objectives, and then how invested different groups are on it. From there, you make the refinements. So really, this slide could easily, if it weren't so texty, <laughs> be a circle, right? To say that this is a wheel, an ongoing cycle of development, that you're, you're going year over year with your progress. So with that, we're going to kind of wrap up. We saved some time um, at the end here. I think if, if people have large questions, is that okay? Okay, if, we, if you have questions that you think you'd like to post to the group, um, that's fine too. Our email addresses are up here. And the other thing I'll say is that there's a lot of great information in that toolkit um, around all of these topics and more. But wait, there's more. Um, so do check out the, the toolkit um, so that you can see examples. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to provide is are examples of places from d other districts who are doing this work across the country. So check it out and if you have questions let us know. So does anyone have a, a question now? What does TNTP stand for? <laughs> That's a great question. TNTP stands for the New Teacher Project. It's founded in 1997 but we um, sort of go by TNTP now because we do more than working with just new teachers. For instance, career pathway and compensation. Other questions? I too am good at wait time. Okay, well, I hope that this was helpful to you all. Uh, feel free to reach out at any point. Um, and we look forward to meeting some of you this afternoon. Thank you. I don't, yes. Thank you, both of you. I don't want you to switch gears yet. Um, I think there are some really valuable tools within the toolkit that I want to guide you to um, and also have an opportunity for you to talk as teams as to some next steps. So if you can stay minds on for a few more minutes with me around career pathways, I think that will um, be a benefit to the conversations that you have throughout the other breakout sessions as well, since so many of the roles that teachers and principal leaders may be taking on influence. Um,